Well, hi there. Welcome to spring. Spring is finally here. It's me. So the forecast is calling for some nice warm temperatures and some rain coming up this weekend. Uh, didn't really have any opportunity to fly after today. Today's actually quite nice, but as you can see, uh, it didn't, it's not going to happen. All right, so I thought I would give a little overview of the engine and give you an idea of what we have done for updates and what we're planning on doing for updates. I know this might be something that some of you have heard before, but I get this question a lot. And so I thought I would just make another quick video um, detailing everything that we've done. So first of all, this airplane used to have a Jabiru 2200 engine on it, 80 horsepower or 85 horsepower, depending on what literature you read. And I'm gonna put up some video footage uh, comparing the performance of the two airplanes. So what this is, is a copy of the Rotax 912 ULS. I'm guessing that if these valve covers were green, and you didn't have the Chinese characters on the engine here and there, the average person would never tell that this was a copy of the 912. It is exactly the same as a 912, right down to Nicosil coated cylinders, to uh, an exact copy of the Bing carburetor. All of the bolts and nuts are all the same size. All of the tolerances are exactly the same you can't tell it's it's a very good copy in fact i'd call it a clone as opposed to a copy um, the way they did that is the patent has expired on the 912 uls and so they can legally now make copies of it and when we got this engine we got it for a third of the price of a new rotax 912. these days these cost closer to two-thirds of the price instead of one third so you are paying a little bit more for them these days but i still think it's a pretty good deal and it is a really good running engine so far remember i'm a test pilot still with this i will be reporting any problems that i have with it and so far there there have been none there hasn't been any issues with it i have a couple of complaints about it but it has nothing to do with the fact that it's a copy it's the design of the engine itself from the original we'll talk about that in a minute one of the things that we did, and I'm saying we because Brent is my silent, not so silent partner in this endeavor. We didn't like the idea of the Rotax 912's warm up. You see, the gearbox runs off of the same engine oil that the rest of the engine runs on. And this gearbox oil needs to be at a certain temperature before you can go full power so that you don't ruin the gearbox. And that's 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, 50 degrees Celsius, I think. So typically, 912s take between 10 and 12 minutes to warm up to that temperature, and we didn't like the fact that we had to sit around on the ground so long warming up. So we did a couple of things to help that. First of all, we put a coolant thermostat in here. So this is a thermostat for the coolant. What it does is when its uh, engine is cold, the coolant gets rerouted through here and goes back through the engine before it comes up and goes through the radiator. So that helps the engine warm up a little bit more. And then when it does warm up, then it just, of course, goes through properly. If the thermostat fails, they typically fail about halfway open. And so you still get some coolant through the radiator, but the engine still might get a little warm. But from what I understand, these engines will run with no coolant in them whatsoever for a while before they finally quit. So we're not really concerned about that. We have a coolant temperature gauge in the cockpit. If the temperatures start to climb, we'll simply land well before any damage happens to the engine. And also we put an oil thermostat in. There's the part number if you're interested right there. Uh, so this is a oil thermostat and this is set up in such a way that you cannot block it. The oil goes through one way until it's warm, and then it goes the other way through the, the radiator to, to cool it back down if you have to. It can't fail. There's no closed position on it. It's either going through the radiator or it's not. And same idea, if it fails in such a way that the oil is no longer going through the, the, the cooler here, we would see that on the, on the temperature gauge 
before it became catastrophic and we would just simply throttle back and then land. So neither of these are set up in such a way that the engine can fail and damage the engine as long as you're paying attention to the temperature gauges. So the longest it's taken me to warm up this engine so far is six minutes. That's half the time. And that was at minus five Celsius, which is about 23 Fahrenheit. So I went from about 20 Fahrenheit to 120 Fahrenheit in six minutes. For those of you who are sort of new to the channel and you don't know which plane this is or what I'm talking about, this is a Zenith 701. And anybody who knows Zenith 701s knows that the throttle cable linkage stuff all kind of happens up just above this shelf. And this plane doesn't have that. And so they're asking, how do I, how does my throttle work? Well, inside the cockpit, it goes up to that bell crank right there. And then you can see that cable going through the firewall. That cable goes through the firewall, hits a splitter here, and then gets split off to both carburetors. And it seems to be working quite well for the moment. Um, I don't like how much friction has to be in it right now. So there is going to be a, a change to that setup here shortly. Uh, you may have noticed a minute ago we are running a lithium battery in here. This is an EarthX. Absolutely thrilled with it. It works fantastically. I know that's not a real word, but whatever. It also comes with a smart charger. You don't have to keep it plugged in, but anytime I have the cowling off and you know it's going to be a couple of days before I fly the plane, I always plug it in because why not? Uh, so you have the oil reservoir here. Uh, this is a dry sump engine, so instead of having a, an oil pan on the bottom of the, the engine block, the oil gets dumped out of the bottom there, pumped into the oil reservoir, and then it goes back through the engine. So that's a little different than most normal engines. They do that because you can put the engine in tighter positions, right? You don't have the big big oil pan hanging off the bottom but now you do have some extra plumbing you got to do and you got to figure out where to put that but that seems to work really well what's irritating about it is the drain plug is up in there and so it's really hard to kind of get your hand up in there and get that out and then it makes a mess on the firewall here so we're going to be putting in one of those spigots where you can just put a hose on it and open the valve and drain the oil out i just i, I i've ordered one it's just not here yet and yeah <laughs> we have we have a horn uh, two horns on the plane as well because why why wouldn't you have a horn? This is the muffler shroud here. So air comes in through here. This scoop is uh, an addition. It normally just has this little lip down here. We thought if we could put more air into it, we would get better heat. Turns out it's the opposite. We want to slow this air down so it heats up longer. I just haven't done anything with that yet. I might put some baffles in maybe to redirect the air. I don't know, something along those lines. But that's where we get the cabin heat from. And I think that's really it in terms of any sort of modifications we've done to it. The engine's been running great. Uh, I've got no complaints except for the fact that it's carbureted. Carbureted engines uh, are perfectly fine if you have one carburetor for the whole engine. We have one carburetor for the right bank of cylinders and we have a carburetor for the left bank of cylinders. And what that means is both carburetors have to be tuned exactly the same so that the left bank and the right bank produce the same amount of power so you don't get any undue vibration. The other thing you have to worry about with carburetors is that these ones, you don't have a mixture control in the cockpit to adjust the ratio of fuel to air going into the engine. You have to have that ratio just right uh, for a number of different reasons. These ones don't have that option. If I want to change the mixture control, I have to take apart this carburetor and manually change uh, little bolts that have holes in them. They're called jets or I change a needle clip position like there's there's some hands-on mechanic-y stuff that you have to do in order to change the mixture. If you live somewhere where it's always the same temperature, like down in the southern states, that's not a problem. The, the carburetor, you set it up for where you live, for the temperature range that you're in, and you're done. Here in Canada, we have temperature ranges from minus 20 Celsius all the way up to 30, 35 Celsius. That's a 50 to 55 degree temperature swing. And that is something you absolutely have to adjust the carburetors for. So far, I've had to adjust the carburetors twice and neither time was fun and I don't want to keep doing that. So what's a guy to do? But 
put an electronic fuel injection on instead. So Edge Performance makes a, an EFI kit that we are going to be taking the carburetors off and bolting a fuel injection system into this engine. Now this manufacturer also produces an EFI kit. I, I just don't know enough about it yet. I would like to see it in action and I just, I haven't seen it in action yet. So, um, you know, per, perhaps one day I'll see it in action and I'll go, oh wow, that was the better choice. Maybe I should have gone with that. But right now, Edge Performance, they have a very solid reputation of, of good quality um, kits for fuel injection and, and their engines and whatnot. So that's what we decided to go with. So now when you talk about fuel injection, now you have to talk about rerouting your fuel lines. And let's get to that in just a second. So first of all, what's it gonna look like? This carburetor and intake manifold comes off as well as this one. The coolant lines get pushed over to the side and then there's going to be a, an air, I don't know if it's plenum is the right word or something. Anyway, there's, there's an air box that goes on here that goes off to each cylinder and each cylinder has its own injector right before the port. So each cylinder is tunable um, and it is an open source map so we can tune it ourselves to make sure that each cylinder is producing the exact same amount of power. It's going to be amazing, hopefully, fingers crossed. So that's what it's going to kind of look like up here, but now we do have to reroute some fuel lines. So with a fuel injection system, you have a fuel rail and you have a uh, fuel line pressurized so that the, the injectors can squirt in that fuel at high velocity to, to feed the engine. That means you need to have a pressurized fuel system and the airplane doesn't. We just have a fuel tank in this wing and a fuel tank in that wing. So what we're going to have to do is put a header tank in and it's going to go behind the seats and we have access to that right up here through this port. So we'll be taking that off and putting a, a, a one gallon header tank in there. We currently have our fuel line coming into the cockpit here and here through some valves. So we'll keep that. And then these lines down here that would run up to the engine, we'll just have both of them go into a Y and then go into the header tank. And then that will feed the engine. We did have some discussion in the last video about do we need to vent the header tank or not? Because to vent the header tank, we have to remove this panel right here and to get access to the fuel tank. So that's going to be a bit of a pain in the butt, but it turns out we, we do need to. We, we're just going to have to do it. So we're going to, we're in fact, we're going to do both sides because the fuel line going in is going to be switched up a size, I think from quarter inch to three eighths or something like that. I don't know. We're going a size bigger with the fuel line to make sure we got lots of fuel flow. So we are going to be taking the, the shoulders off here and, and getting some access into the wing tank. So that's going to be a bit of a pain in the butt, but it's got to, it's got to be done to make it all work well. So that's the plan. That's what we're gonna do. We're gonna um, we're gonna we're gonna tear the airplane back apart and, <laughs> and modify it and make it even better. One of the cool things about having the EFI is we won't have to tune the carburetors anymore. The carburetors won't exist, so it'll always be correct. We won't have to um, balance them. We won't have to adjust them for different temperatures. There's no chance for carburetor icing anymore because there are no carburetors. It is going to increase our fuel economy significantly. I think they said by like 15 to 20%. So that's, that's a huge improvement in fuel burn. And they say you pick up a few extra horsepower as well. So, I mean, why not? More power is always better, right? So if that's the case, fantastic. But I'm really more concerned with the lack of maintenance we're going to have to do with these carburetors. Everything's just going to be, you turn the key and it just works. It's going to be great. One of the other things we hope to do this summer is change these round tubed uh, wing struts to streamlined wing struts. So that apparently picks up about five miles an hour in cruise, which is kind of cool. We're hoping, I mean, even if it picks up a little bit, that'll be fine, but whatever. They're gonna be going on because we have them. Um, there's a spare door if anybody wants one with a great big crack in it. <laughs> that was my fault, that's why we have a new door. Anyway, that's, um, that's pretty much it, I think. I don't think there's any other news. Uh, we do have some tinkering to do on the dash still. We gotta get that engine monitoring system calibrated a little bit better so we actually have the fuel gauges working and, and one of the EGTs isn't working, so we had to mess with that too a little bit, but we're gonna get that all done. Um, and then, then we're hoping for a nice season of flying. So if we can get rid of the snow, we can get back up in the air, but it looks like we're gonna be on the ground for at least another week, so. I figured this is the best I can do. There will be some, well, maybe there was already. I'm not sure how I'm going to edit this, but there's going to be a comparison video between the Jabiru, the old engine, and this new engine. 
what a difference. Anyway, um, I guess that's it for now. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I'm sorry there's not more flying and I'm sorry there was a lot of talking. I hope it was interesting. If you have any questions about the engine, any suggestions or comments or whatever, hit me up in the comments below. I like, I like getting the comments and I like answering them. I like answering questions. So hit me up and we'll go from there. Otherwise, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your week and we'll see you next time. All right, flaps are still down. We'll try this short takeoff again. Now, we don't have any wind, and it is 27 degrees out.